Here we go! My friends, today we're going to examine the strangest stage in all of GoldenEye 007, explore some of its mysteries, and take in the nostalgic spirit of this unusual yet familiar world of 90s gaming architecture. Yes indeed, I'm talking about none other than Silo, the sixth stage in GoldenEye, and one that was made specifically for the video game, never being encountered in the movie. The events of Silo supposedly take place two years before the current time in the game's canon in the Soviet Republic of Kyrgyzstan. And the stage is chock full of unused assets, strange corridors, and eerie relics of a bygone era. So come with me as we explore Silo, GoldenEye's most mysterious stage. One of the most enduring of all mysteries on Silo has to do with General Arkady Grigorovich Uramov, or at least what he's holding, namely this briefcase. He's already holding the briefcase when you first encounter him, which is odd because there are very few characters holding any non-weapon item in the game at all. It's a weird extra object that has no real purpose in the game, at least the finished version of the game. It's well accepted that it likely had some purpose in the beta version, likely as some kind of objective, before the level was reworked. Some have speculated that the briefcase may have contained some blueprints, like we find in safes on other stages, while others have speculated that it contained launch codes for the missiles here on Silo. Either way, the briefcase is very strange and has some extremely unusual properties that I only noticed recently. If we turn on invisibility and stand near Ormov and shoot his briefcase, he has absolutely no reaction. The shots don't even land or damage the briefcase, almost as if there's some kind of magical force field around it. This is extremely strange, and nearly no other object held by any NPC in the game acts this way. You know, if you shoot at the KF-7s other guards are holding, they'll react and recoil as they should when they get hit. Even Dr. Doak's door decoder works this way. It's near universal guard behavior. However, Ormov's briefcase does not do this. The only other NPC and item I can think of which behaves this way is Trevelyan's shotgun on caverns. But here's the twist. Trevelyan on caverns is completely invincible. Even with the gold PP7, there's just no possible way to pass him away. So it makes sense Trev and his shotgun are programmed to take no damage at all. However, if you shoot Ormov with the gold PP7, he does indeed pass away. And you can do this without the gold PP7 as, as well, he just has a lot of health, it takes a lot of shots. That being said, it's clear that Ormov isn't invincible, yet his briefcase acts as if he, or at least his briefcase is. It's just so truly strange and really shocked me when I recently discovered this unique property of Ormov's briefcase. Not to mention the way he kind of dances around here standing in place, which is also just very odd. But that's not all, because the mystery deepens if you do shoot Ormov and cause him to depart this earthly coil. Because not only do you pick up his briefcase, but you also pick up his key. The key only appears as a single dash in the menu select and has no visual to it at all in the watch menu, despite it looking like most other key cards on the floor. So this is definitely an unfinished asset that just made its way into the final game for one reason or another. That being said, there's similar speculation as to the use of the key, namely that perhaps it was used to unlock the briefcase itself, or perhaps it would activate launch codes, but perhaps it had yet another purpose. Maybe it could be used to open some door or ceiling somewhere on the level. So here's a fun one that some classic friends will be familiar with, but which might be new to others. In the upright silo rooms with catwalks, where there's physically a missile located, if you switch to unarmed, the roof opens. You get to see the clear blue sky, and believe it or not, we will be talking more about the sky in detail later. This is such a weird little quirk because nowhere else in the game does switching to unarmed really do something like this. It's usually pressing B that opens a door or a gate, rather than switching to unarmed. 
The only other time switching to unarmed does anything is to initiate a sequence of events on statue, but that's just wildly different from this. Here's what the old Death Star website has to say about the silo roof. After the second fuel room, if you go left instead of right, you'll come to a silo with a rocket. Look up and switch to unarmed. The roof should open. I know it does nothing in the final game, but I also have no idea what it meant in the beta version either. I've heard you need a gold PP7 to do this, but you don't. I don't know where that came from. There's also a connection with Ormov's key. Once you're inside the part of the silo, select the key as your weapon. If you press B or try A while you're using the key, the roof will open at your command. Press A again and the roof will close. Weird. It's been concluded that this door opens because it was once tied in with an objective. Launching the missile, for whatever reason, was most likely the objective. So I tried this whole pressing B or trying A with Ormov's key selected, and I couldn't find anything that worked, so I'm still not sure what that's all about. Something I didn't know until recently was that it's only the silo roofs with the missiles in them which open. You know, these other silo rooms don't open this way. I've tried opening this one up here on the top floor to get a nice close view, but I'm not sure it's possible, even though I do have a weird memory of seeing a screenshot of it being open back in the day. Anyhow, opening the silo roofs is just yet another thing that adds to the mystique and lore of this very strange level in GoldenEye 007. Take a look at this. Do you know where I am in this strange blue area? I'm actually in a secret vent near the start of the stage, thanks to Game Shark codes found by legendary N64 Game Sharker Subdrag back in the early 2000s. You can't really move around or do stuff here, there's not really any collision to even move, but it's fascinating to look around, especially at some place that I've just never really checked out before. If we look at this weird screenshot of the level, you can really see just how far up this vent extends, which is just so fascinating. It's definitely just one more example of how the developers of the game, early on, were simply making the architecture of the stages without really knowing what objectives would go where or anything like that. And Silo, because it has no canonical analog in the movie, definitely went through numerous changes in objectives as we've discussed. There's also this well-known ladder down here, even though it's not climbable. There are just so many of these remarkably strange and unused spaces in Silo, which I suppose makes sense as it's a large stage with tight corridors and lots of other architecture filling in the stage. But it certainly makes it one of the more classic examples of a Nintendo 64 level with so much unused space, which I love to see, explore, and imagine. Look up at the sky. Yes, I told you we would come back to it here. Silo is one of three levels in Goldeneye, along with Bunker 1 and Frigate, which have no sky texture programmed to them at all. I know this sounds weird, and it is. You can kind of see it here on Silo, there's no clouds or anything like that. But on Frigate, there are clouds, even though there's technically no sky texture. So what does this all really mean? While well, all the other levels have these sort of properties hard-coded to the skies of the missions, even the entirely indoor ones like Facility. These properties include things like Far Fog, Near Fog, Blend, Intensity, stuff like that, and frankly, they're not really discernible in-game to the casual eye. In fact, we didn't even really know about these until only a few years ago. That being said, they do have discernible consequences. For example, some stages are definitely laggier than others, and the sky is a factor in that. Now what this means is that Bunker 1, Silo, and Frigate will either load no sky at all if you start the game and jump into one of these stages, or they'll take on the properties of whichever previously skyed level you played before loading one of these stages. Take a look at Bunker 1. On most runs, you'll see the guards load in fairly normally. They're solid, everything looks in order. 
However, on my Bunker 1 Agent 16, I loaded up Jungle beforehand, thus importing the Jungle Sky properties into Bunker. Jungle's a notoriously laggy stage, and in the opening cutscene, you can clearly see this guard sort of become a ghost due to the way the Sky properties affect things like draw distance and lag. I felt as though the Jungle Sky helped here, in reducing draw distance on Bunker 1, which felt advantageous to me when playing for the Tide World Record. But that being said, everyone has their own preferences, with loading up Depot being a more common pre-Bunker 1 level. So back to Silo. What's funny is that, throughout the earlier decades, back when we didn't really have an understanding of this whole concept, you would swear that some sessions just felt laggier than others, hampering your speedrun attempts. It sounded like silly copium at the time, you know, ah, oh, tonight's just a laggy load or something. But now with our improved understanding, it's known that yeah, some sessions might have loaded a level sky, which brought in more lag into silo than others. And players were genuinely experiencing a very real phenomenon. It's still not really well known which level's sky is best to preload ahead of a Bunker 1 or silo or frigate session, well, Frigate in particular needs Surface 1 under some conditions if you're using the very complex and unwieldy 2.3 control style to rescue one of the hostages in the opening cutscene, but Silo is anyone's guess, and mostly preference. That being said, I did notice at least one strange thing when messing around with certain settings and sky loads. In this case, I had the Bunker 2 sky load by virtue of simply entering that stage and then playing Silo. And here I also had wide screen on as my aspect ratio of choice, because this can probably affect things as well. I noticed that this door sometimes shows through the actual launch missile and is visible from the other side. This is just some kind of draw distance glitch, or draw order, or whatever. It's probably similar in nature to this thing I found on Dam, where the Dam Island texture shows through the wall and onto the glass of the watchtowers. But it is definitely an odd quirk. And you wonder, with 17 other levels' skies to bring in, just how many of these other minor glitches are there still yet to be found on Silo, if not even a bigger glitch that may have some kind of impact when it comes to speedrunning the game. Now here's a remarkable piece of GoldenEye trivia or lore that not too many people know, but I find quite fascinating. On Silo, Secret and Double O Agent, one of the objectives is to collect four pieces of circuit boards strewn about in the main rooms of the Silo. They're these little green things. Now interestingly, if you pause, you'll see they all have different names, and believe it or not, they are named after various pieces of the N64. You have the I.O. or Input-Output Board, the RSP or Reality Signal Processor circuit board, the central processing unit, the RDP one, I couldn't find a source with an exact name, so let me know if you know which piece that represents. And anyhow, this is just quite a nice little Easter egg thrown in there by the developers. Another fascinating thing on Silo that virtually no one pays attention to is the fact that the main rooms where you have to throw plastiques and pick up the circuitry are all named, and the key cards you can get from each room also show these names. The first one is 4H4, as you can see written on the wall here, and also from the keycard you pick up from the scientist. The second one is 4C3, then there's 4K2, and finally 4A1. 4A1, the final one with the satellite, does not have a keycard. I guess they didn't want to put one there ahead of the last hallway towards Ormov, but it definitely does have a name, 4A1. Maybe it's my favorite room of all. Well, maybe not. I like the third room, 4K2, as well. I like them all. Who's to say? I wonder what exactly these names represent, and I've never found a good source on it. It's probably out there in some developer interview or old website, but I'm still unsure. So it's a mystery to me for now. And there we go, my friends, five strange mysteries and oddities showing why Silo is perhaps the most strange and unusual stage of all in GoldenEye 007. It's a stage I love where I've set numerous world records over the years, though I no longer hold any, but even so, it brings back some great memories. That being said, it's always nice to slow down, take a look around, and absorb some of the environment that I didn't really appreciate so much when I was grinding away, zooming through the stage as fast as I could. 
If you enjoyed this video, a like, subscribe, and comment always help out, and let me know if you'd like to see me explore any other stage in GoldenEye in this way. Thank you all for watching, my friends. Thanks for all your support lately. It's truly appreciated to every single one of you. Peace, love, and respect to everyone watching. Stay true, my friends, and I'll see you in the next stream or video.